a servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are called, beloved in God the Father, and kept for Jesus Christ, may mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain people have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were designated for this condemnation. Ungodly people, who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only Master and Lord Jesus Christ. Now I want to remind you, although you once fully knew it, that Jesus, who saved a people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels, who did not stay within their own position of authority, but left their proper dwelling, he has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, which likewise indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desires, serve as an example by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. Yet in like manner, these people also, relying on their dreams, defile the flesh, reject authority, and blaspheme the glorious ones. But when the archangel Michael, contending with the devil, was disputing about the body of Moses, he did not presume to pronounce a blasphemous judgment, but said, The Lord rebuke you. But these people blaspheme all that they do not understand, and they are destroyed by all that they, like unreasoning animals, understand instinctively. Woe to them, for they walk in the way of Cain, and abandon themselves for the sake of gain to Balaam's error, and perished in Korah's rebellion. These are hidden reefs at your love feasts, as they feast with you without fear. Shepherds feeding themselves, waterless clouds swept along by winds, fruitless trees in late autumn twice dead uprooted, wild waves of the sea casting up the foam of their own shame, wandering stars for whom the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved forever. It was also about these that Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment on all and to convict all the ungodly of all their deeds of ungodliness that they have committed in such an ungodly way and of all the harsh things that ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are grumblers, malcontents, following their own sinful desires. They are loud mouth boasters, showing favoritism to gain advantage. But you must remember, beloved, the predictions of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. They said to you, In the last time there will be scoffers, following their own ungodly passions. It is these who cause divisions, worldly people devoid of the Spirit. But you, beloved, building yourself up in the most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourself in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. And have mercy on those who doubt, Save others by snatching them out of the fire. To others show mercy with fear, hating even the garment stained by the flesh. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. So we got through three last time, so we'll pick up the four. For certain people have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were designated for this condemnation. Ungodly people who perverted the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only Master and Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. Well, what type of people have crept in? Those who oppose God. Okay. Because they're ungodly people. Certain ungodly people. It implies a little something. It implies a little bit that there's only a few of them, to me. Certain people. In and amongst the whole congregation. Well, what is implied to you? What did you get from that? That's what it kind of implied to me, that there's only a few of them. Did you get any other kind of implication from it? I, I think the people know him, know them, but he's being very tactful about there's certain people among us who are Texas A&M fans. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You know who they are, but I'm not going to name names. Okay. 
there are certain people among us who like to drink German beer. Wait, no, that would be everybody. <laughs> I, got a, I got a footnote here in line that says, uh, instead of just certain men, it says men who were marked out for condemnation. Marked out for condemnation, because it says long ago they were designated for this condemnation. Mm -hmm. But if you remember when we read through the whole thing, in this short 25-verse letter, Jude repeatedly implies that they recognize them, like Pastor was saying. They, they must have some sense that these people exist. Because otherwise, if you send a letter saying, there are certain people among you, they're going to all start looking at each other. Egypt. Maybe that's a good thing. I don't know. <laughs> we'll see. Though these people were professing to follow God, how do they deny him? Because they're members of the congregation. This is what's interesting about this passage. They are seen as members of the congregation, members of the body. But they are, they've crept in. And though they're professing to follow God, how do they deny God? Uh, I think by their attitude. By their attitude? <clears throat> that comes out in their behavior. Okay. Well, in their words and deeds. That's how, how you can tell who they are. What comes from our words and deeds in our congregation, in our Christian life, in the Christian community? What comes out through our words and deeds? Our attitude. Our attitude, okay. Well, also our doctrine. What we believe comes out through what we say, right? So these certain people will be able to be identified by what they're saying. He talks about another gospel, right? I find it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith. So this faith can be, these people can be identified by how they represent that faith, what they say about that faith, what that faith means to them. Well, what does Jude mean by crept in unnoticed? The congregation that describes the congregation? What does he mean by They've crept in unnoticed. It's subtle. Subtle, okay. If you have a belief that, let's say take one of the biggies, that were justified by grace alone through faith alone in Christ alone, and somebody comes in and says, right off the bat, I want to be a member of your congregation, I want to teach a Bible study, and I want to make sure everybody knows that Jesus isn't the only way. That's not creeping in. That's a pretty red, big red flag that says, I'm a false teacher and I want to come into your church and teach false doctrine. So the creeping in is more subtle than that. It might not be intentional. Or it might be intentional. They might have a different belief and think, well, that church believes wrongly. I'm going to start going there. I'm going to become a member there and I'm going to make sure that they understand what I believe about that. Or it may be that they're just not adequately prepared to teach, and they teach false things. But in any way you look at it, they've crept in unnoticed. The congregation is unaware. The people didn't realize that these ungodly people were there at first. They're being made aware that they're there now. Is this a condemnation of the congregation? Is Jude writing to this congregation and condemning the congregation for these false teachers existing in their midst. These false teachers exist in their midst, and Jude's saying, it's your fault. Well, I put perhaps and perhaps not. Maybe they should have recognized them by their words and their deeds, what they say, what they do, that it's not lining up with Scripture. But maybe it's really subtle, like the pastor was saying. God says that these men were uh, who long ago were designated for this condemnation. Well, what condemnation is he talking about? I think it's not condemnation so much as a warning. He's appealing, he says to them, to contend for the faith mm -hmm. that was once delivered. You have a faith. As a, as a warning. You have a Even doctor. You uh, mm -hmm. So he's not necessarily condemning them. He's giving them a warning. Well, yeah, it's a warning. 
be alert. Found it necessary. Like where the scripture constantly says, be on guard, be watch, watchful, that kind of thing. Steve. Liken this to the, uh, the time when uh, the, the Pope uh, started the first crusades and told everybody that because of God's grace, you know, and his saving, saving faith, that uh, you could go ahead and kill anybody you want to sin and do whatever you want to do because you are saved by his grace. And that was a directive no. by the head of the church, you know, the universal church during that time. And I see the same thing happening here with the leadership of the local churches saying, uh, you know, you are saved by grace and you can continue to sin and there's nothing wrong with it. So I, I see a warning or a red flag or something happening there. And so, of course, where a writer knows, or as an example, history does repeat itself. Uh, and why not history in the church repeating itself too? Okay, I like that. Yeah, um, He's not just addressing it to the leaders of the congregation, although they would be the ones to receive the letter, right? But he's not just saying, dear elders of the congregation at Jerusalem that I'm writing to. He's writing to the entire group of people. But you might say also, well, the pastor there, the leader there, the elder there, should know, should be the first to recognize sometimes a false teacher in their midst, somebody who's denying the faith in their midst. That should be the pastor. The red flag should go all over the place if the pastor knows his congregation. But he's writing to all of them. Why is he writing to all of them? How could false teachers have crept in? How could they have even gotten there if was nobody aware that they were denying their Lord and Master, Jesus Christ, and doing this false teaching? Unaware until Jude wrote the letter. Not everybody was present during the time of Christ. And so a lot of information is secondary, and a lot of people misinterpret secondary information and come up with their own, mm -hmm. their own words. How do false teachers creep into the modern church? They exist. Well, it's, I think it's kind of subtle. You know, they... The footnote, one of the footnotes I've got in here, it says, even some of our churches today have false, i.e. godless, teachers who have, quote-unquote, secretly slipped in and are twisting the Bible's teaching to justify their own opinions, lifestyles, or wrong behavior. And they're, they're, so it's, it may, somebody doesn't come crashing in and you know deny everything all at once, but they can start twisting Scripture around as, to, right. to, to do what they think is their take on everything rather than what it actually says. I can remember years and years ago, somebody sitting in one of the Bible coffee cafes and just coming right out with a, an obvious red flag false doctrine. It went totally against anything that was in the Bible and in our confessions. And most people were just sitting there. Probably, because who likes to confront that stuff? Who likes to raise their hand and say, well, I'm sorry, that's a false teaching. You shouldn't be teaching that in this class. This is a Lutheran church and a Christian church, and you shouldn't be teaching that. But there may not be, they may not be aware themselves of, of what is correct. So okay. they, they the creeping in factor. Yeah. If the, if the congregation isn't aware, right. it's easier to creep in. Uh, I was just noticing the footnotes. Uh, Luther is talking about, he says, wicked men will come and they will not persevere. They always have this fault of teaching something different than new. Mm -hmm. A wicked spirit not rooted in solid doctrine causes this. It always looks for something new and a better doctrine. And I stole that and put it on one of the slides, oh. so we're going to get there. <laughs> right. Because Luther is much smarter than I am. Yeah. But listen, here's from Timothy. This is what I, was, I think I was thinking about a little bit ago. But understand this, that in the last days, when are the last days? Days. Are we waiting for them? No. No. They're now. No. Our last days. A lot of people believe in this whole, somebody last week mentioned this premillennial dispensational <laughs> thinking. A lot of people believe that we're in a different time now. We're not in the last days. There's last days to come. 
So we are in the last days, and we've been in the last days since the cross, right? That in the last days, in the entire age of the church, there will come times of difficulty for people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless. I don't like this list. <laughs> Unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness, which would make it easy to slip in unaware, but denying its power. They all apply today. Exactly, Rudy. Every one of these applies today and has applied since the cross. At some point, in some generation, this has been true. People have always been lovers of self. That's how we're born. We're narcissists at heart. I was also thinking of 4, 3, and 4. Do you have that? No, I don't, but let's go ahead and read that, too. That's uh, still in Second Timothy. For a time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. Yeah. So if you have even pastors or Bible study leaders that are teaching what the itching ears mm -hmm. want to hear, then sometimes it's... And it'll be real easy for them to slip not. in. They'll be invited in. That's even worse than creeping in. They'll be invited in. We want to be taught this non-biblical Bible study, so come on down. Well, but if we throw Jesus' name around a little bit and we toss in a scripture here and there, it becomes a Bible study. Is that true? We've talked about the fact that just, I think we have, about the fact that just because somebody uses Jesus' name doesn't make them a true teacher. That's why I often wonder why the Mormon Church calls themselves uh, Latter-day Saints. I mean, Jesus, the Church of Jesus Christ. All they had to do was redefine who Jesus was. That's all they had to do. And that's what that's what most people will do. There's a new revelation of Joseph Smith so yeah. that God's sense of theology took a turn. Did new oh special revelation. Want to talk about that? Yeah. So God has a had a another revelation revealed itself to the, somebody. Mm -hmm. We don't follow the. Faith once for all delivered to the saints. That's in the sixty-six books that are in the in well, this. That's what happened with Muhammad too. He had a new revelation and and went in a different direction. Yeah. David so Koresh was the same way. All false teachers. It almost always starts. I heard somebody say one time, it probably always starts. But they always they said almost just because you don't want to be too well, dogmatic. But there, it, it's if you miss Christ, if you miss read Christ, if you misinterpret Christ, if you reinvent Christ, if you put Jesus plus, you've well, got a false religion. I heard it recently preached that if you have the Holy Spirit in your heart, you'll know the truth. Uh -huh. and the truth will make you free. Well, how does the Holy Spirit work? He just doesn't pop into your heart. He works through the word and sacraments. But have this preached, I think it's dangerous that we can be anything and do anything but be anywhere. Mm -hmm. And if the Holy Spirit comes into your heart, we have the truth. Well, the side of you know, the means of grace. Right. And when the means of grace are not present, our confessions will say, wherever the word is purely preached and the sacraments are rightly administered, there the church is. You can have a bunch of people calling themselves Christians and a bunch of people using Jesus' name. When the legend becomes fact, mm -hmm. print the legend. So many people believe that if, if something is said, 
enough times they're going to believe what's said, even though they don't know that it's a myth or a legend. Mm -hmm. well, Mr. here's the thing. We're talking about new revelations and new prophets and everything. Do you think, uh, you think scribes and Pharisees felt that way about Jesus? He always asks such good questions. Um, probably, yeah. Because well, they had, they had, there was a big, huge difference between the faith of the fathers, the old time, all these Old Testament folk, and the Pharisees. The Pharisees were really not following the teachings that had been passed down to them. So when Jesus came in to kind of correct all of that and to fulfill all of that, they didn't recognize it. To them, it was a false teaching. Right. Well, you know how I'm always talking about, you know, the, the brave dissenter is not always a Martin Luther, sometimes just a nut. Um, here's the thing, too, that the whole thing about a new revelation, I mean, if you think about it, every single prophet of the Old Testament, up to and including Christ himself, was, quote, unquote, a new revelation. The apostles themselves taught some things that were new. For instance, the whole, you know, oh, we now have to obey the dietary laws of Moses. That was really new. And that was very definitely a change from the Old Testament. I mean, God did say, you cannot eat these things or you will be cut off from your people. So, you know, to me, for instance, the Mormons. To me, in a sense, it's a waste of time to argue about whether Joseph Smith was really a prophet or not. Because I wasn't there. I never met the guy. You know, how am I supposed to know what's in his heart? The answer is, I can't. It's like if a Christian comes to me today and says, oh, God spoke to me last night in a dream. Personally, I'm about 99% of the time doubting that that's the case. But how am I supposed to read their mind? To me, the acid test is not so much the novelty. It's how does that comport with the rest of Scripture? In other words, God doesn't say, follow me, and then tomorrow say, oh, by the way, follow other gods. So to me, the reason I would disagree with a Mormon is not Joseph Smith is a prophet, but rather Joseph Smith taught salvation by works. Mm -hmm. Joseph Smith taught that there are three gods in heaven, things like that. In other words, I think we need to get down into the right. nitty-gritty of what exactly is the teaching and what is wrong with it rather than just the novelty in itself. Although that is certainly a red right. warning light. I would totally agree with you. But the, I think some of what underlies all that is that the people hearing what's going on, people that meet Mormons, that meet other people, they don't know enough about the doctrine Often they don't. to really understand that that's where they should be addressing the issue. They just know Joseph Smith claimed to put on some funny glasses and read these plates, and there's a new revelation from God. Yeah. <coughs> Steve had his hand up first. Gee, I almost forgot. You know, you can tell me something, and I can tell Pastor something, you can tell Jim something, and, and by the time it gets to the eighth person, it's not going to be word for word when you told me. There's going to be a lost in, you know, in, in translation or something. And so, can you imagine the things that people said and they saw and, and they were misinterpreted by other people and then they went out and told other people what they saw? And, you know, sometimes you don't get the full story. Which is why we have the faith that's supposed to be handed down. It's supposed to not be, I'm going to try and do this from memory. It's like, let me open the book and read to you what God said. Pastor. Well, the author of Jude reveals how these people pervert the truth. If we continue. Yeah, the sensuality. What does that mean? Yeah, and then, yeah. And then other and things. Verse four, yeah. and it, it just says these two things basically are what they're doing. They pervert it into the sensuality and they deny Jesus. That's as a result of this perversion. It's, the, the, the grace doesn't matter. All right. Well, uh, Oh, I was just going to say uh, what Steve just said about you tell two friends and they two tell friends and so on and so on and so on and the thing gets changed. That's exactly one of the arguments that was used. I don't know how many, how many of you all have seen the entire debate between Ken Ham and Bill Nye? I have you know, the one I watched the whole thing. Most of it is. Yeah, I watched the whole thing on YouTube <clears> or whatever. Well, one of the points that Bill Nye made was basically... It's funny, he said, I'm not going to attack the Bible. 
but he did. Mm -hmm. Okay, which I don't want to get into that whole debate, but I'm just saying one of his points was, how many of us ever played the telephone game, right? You tell someone something, they whisper it to the next person, so forth. So his argument was, how can you rely on the Old Testament account of Noah's flood or creation or whatever if it's been passed down through so many hands? How do we know what the original was? Which, on the surface, seems like a valid argument, right? It is a valid argument. I just don't agree with it. Right. It's a stronger argument than a lot of Christians tend to think. That's all I'm saying. If I'm we, not agreeing with it. I'm just saying. Well, one of the things that Christians fail to understand, and I just I was this way, so I know, is you don't just look at the Old Testament. You look at the Old Testament through the lens of the New Testament. And Jesus himself addresses Noah. So if, you, <coughs> if you've already denied Jesus, you're not going to believe the story he tells about Noah and the flood, or even Adam and Eve, when he talks about Adam and Eve. You're not going to believe any of the stories he tells, because you've already denied him in your mind. You may not have said it, but you're saying it by other words that you're using. So if you look at the New Testament, it says, it doesn't exactly interpret the Old Testament. Okay, I know we're going to interpret the book of Numbers, but if you want to really understand something in the Old Testament, find a reference to it in the New Testament. Very helpful. What does designated for condemnation mean? Well, long ago the Old Testament prophets uh, warned of, peop uh, of people who perverting the truth would suffer God's rejection. Don't you dare pervert the truth or God will reject you. This is the age-old question, what is truth? Uh, at the University of Texas Tower, they have inscribed in stone, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. What they didn't put up there, if you continue my word, then you are my disciples indeed, mm -hmm. and you shall know the truth. So my word is where we find the truth. And that's one of those cliches where people quote that all the time, and they'll say it like, well, if you know that two plus two equals four, then that will set you free. Now, that's knowing Jesus meant. It's not anything like what he meant, but that's how it's often used. It's used as just a generic phrase they yank and it's used by non-christians too to just say you know you need to believe me because if you know the truth then it'll set you free from what free from Even what the buildings in my old high school back home they had a right over the entryway they had knowledge is the light of the world i still remember that now properly understood there's nothing wrong with that saying of course you might a christian might immediately think well i thought christ was the light of the world but eh. you know what they're saying yeah just like those subtle sayings that say, enter to learn, go forth to serve. Those are all nobly intended. Right. Yeah. And it's very possible, given putting the best construction on it, to say the person who originally started throwing that out there, putting it in marble or whatever, knew what he was talking about. And then people have just not taught what it meant yeah. over the years. Sure. Second Kings, there's just a story going on in Second Kings. They despised his statutes and his covenant that he made with their fathers and the warnings that he had given. Who are they? God's people. They went after false idols and became false. When did they go after false idols? Many times. Many times. And immediately after God saved them. A lot of times. And they followed the nations that were around them, even though God from time to time said, don't do what they do. Don't follow what they what they say. Right? Um, concerning whom the Lord had commanded them that they should not do like them. And they burned their sons and daughters as offerings and used divination and omens and sold themselves to do evil in the sight of the Lord. They not only burned their sons and daughters, but they sold themselves for the purpose of doing evil in the sight of the Lord, provoking him to anger. Therefore, what did the Lord do? Therefore, the Lord was very angry with Israel and removed them out of his sight. This is about the northern kingdom, right? Uh -huh. And he would then have grace on them. It was always a cycle of, here's what I want you to do. They said, we will do whatever you say. They would almost immediately stop doing whatever he said. Then he would have grace on them. And it's just this learning of this, how God works. You know, he tells us, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength, love your neighbors yourself. And we don't do it. But he has grace on us. 
Well, what did fall, the false teachers do? They perverted the grace of God into sensuality, right? What does that mean? What does sensuality mean here? Sexual immorality. Sexual immorality. Is that the only thing it means? Disobedience. That's disobedience. the primary meaning of yeah. sensuality. Whatever it feels be, right. Yeah, anything that uh, has to do with the senses that you are enjoying. It could be. Maybe probably to excess. So yeah, anything to excess. Anything. Enjoying too much food or wine. Gluttony, or, right. Yeah, gluttony. Or, um, but it not only means they're sexual sins, but it means more than that. It's whatever corrupts, you know, all corrupt desires. Because they, they appeal to a certain part of us. Right? Well, can I... That's your job, Jim. That's why you're here. <laughs> That's my job. Oh, boy. <laughs> Anyway, um, I believe that sensuality, I mean, if you look it up in the dictionary, it means sex, okay? Personal ads or whatever the new, new equivalent is, they say if someone's sensual, it basically means easy. That means they're desirable. Uh, it basically means I'm willing to jump in the sack is what it really means. But well, it means they got your attention. It means they diverted your attention. Right, my point, yeah. Well, they didn't pervert it, they got it. But my point is... I said divert, actually. There are, I know that there is more than one list of sins in the New Testament where uh -huh. sensuality is listed specifically alongside of things like pride and whatnot. So I'm mm -hmm. thinking, I think he, because I know there's a number of places, not just in Jude, where false teachers are, they're basically accused of being Elmer Gantry. Mm -hmm. You know, they're, mm -hmm. they're, they're in the Jesus business because they want to fool around with a bunch of women. They well... You know, but also, I, oh, I, and I'm not saying yeah. they weren't doing other sins. Yeah. I'm just saying specifically, uh, sensuality is. There are definitely places where it means sexual sin. Because, but it, uh, all I'm telling you, or trying to share, is that it means more than that when you look at the entire context of the book of Jude. It's only 25 verses, and he talks about their own sinful mm -hmm. desires. They follow right. their I'm own not sinful desires. That was the only sensual desire. So, it, sexual it didn't say they perverted the grace of God into sexual immorality. Yeah, it says important. sensuality, things that appeal to the senses. Well, what appeals to your senses? Being right all the time. Some people have a real strong desire to be right all the time. Some people have a real strong desire to eat too much or drink too much. It, it, things appeal to them. They're sensual. They appeal to their senses. Well, how could the saved end up denying Christ? Here we have people in this congregation who are saved people how could they end up denying Christ? Denying Christ would never sin. Yeah. But, I mean, in the grand scheme of things, they, they're, um, these people who are the false teachers that have crept in unnoticed, um, they're denying their own Master and Lord, which is how you know that these people were, at one point, believed to be Christians, because they're denying their Master and their Lord. They're not just denying Jesus, they're denying their Master and Lord. Well, this is what Luther wrote. I think you started reading this earlier, but now you have obtained freedom through Christ. That is, you are above all laws, both in your own conscience and in the sight of God. You are blessed and saved. Christ is your life. Therefore, even though the law, sin, and death may frighten you, they can neither harm you nor cause you despair. This is your brilliant and inestimable freedom. Now it is up to you to be diligently on your guard, not to use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. Where does it say that in scripture? This evil is very widespread, and it is the worst of all evils that Satan arouses against the teaching of faith. You can have faith and pursue every opportunity for the flesh, that in many people he so... Uh, he soon transforms the freedom for which Christ has set us free into an opportunity for the flesh. You are free. You are forgiven. What's the harm in doing that? Did God really say? It really always goes back to the beginning. The flesh simply does not understand the teaching of grace, namely that we are not justified by works, but by faith alone. And that the law has no justification over us. The law doesn't justify. Therefore, 
when it hears this teaching, it transforms it into licentiousness and immediately draws the inference, if we are without the law, then let us live as we please. And he's paraphrasing scripture here. Let us not do good, let us not give to the needy, much less do we have to endure anything evil. For there is no law to compel us. Thus, there is a danger on both sides. Although the one is more tolerable than the other, if grace or faith is not preached, no one is saved. For faith alone justifies and saves. On the other hand, if faith is preached as it must be preached, the majority of men understand the teaching about faith in a fleshly way. Paraphrasing that last part, if you only preach the law, you will never save anybody. If you only pe preach the gospel, you'll create a whole bunch of people that think they can do whatever they want. So you need the law and the gospel. Cheap grace. Cheap grace. Where was Luther talking? What was the kind of, what was his, um... It's in his 27th volume. I'm not sure. I, I actually think I have it on a shelf somewhere at home, but I don't remember which, okay, I was just wondering what which, was which sermon series it was from or whatever. What was the sermon? It's a collection of his sermons and okay. teachings. And okay, stuff. I just yeah. didn't know what. So I think it's interesting. <clears throat> One of Luther's sermons, he, he talks about, it's a Christmas, uh, and the text is, of our, there's no room for Mary and Joseph in the inn. And then he blasts the Germans and said, you Germans, if they knocked on your door, you wouldn't let them in either. You wouldn't give them food, beer, anything. No bed, nothing. Mm -hmm. you, you, know, you Germans are just... No better than get out of here, get out of my life, get out of my face. I want to do my own thing. And so, I, as a pastor, I see that happening every Sunday after Easter and the, mm -hmm. the Sunday after Christmas. And I'm going to do my own thing on Christmas. I know some people, like, Christmas is the day I'm in my pajamas and I'm going to be in my pajamas all day long and I'm going to live the life, whatever, and don't. Talk to me about being bad, not going to church or anything like that. I had opportunity on Christmas Day to, when we were reading the story out of Luke to pause as part of our discussion and say, think about it. There's no room at the inn. There's no room. We don't have any room for Jesus. It's kind of a connection there like Luther was. I didn't even know Luther said that. But it's like there's, we have no room in our inn for him until he makes room for it. He creates the space for it. And then we still are always trying to kick him out. Uh, I think it's interesting that the, the term in Greek, <clears throat> I, I forget, I think it's Bailey, if my mind remembers, serves me right, wrote about the word in in Greek, and it can mean guest room. Mm -hmm. It could be some room in the house, and there was no room in the guest room for, for them to be. So they went below where the animals were. Right. I would draw you a picture if this was a whiteboard, but I was teaching on something and that came up. I think it might have even been in the Revelation that class, but I can't remember. The their rooms, their houses were off in tiers. He was telling me about that. Yeah. They he built against hills part. a lot, and their houses were off in <laughs> tiers. So they would have a lower room where people would enter, and then they'd have a set of stairs that would go up to an upper raised platform. That upper raised platform was considered the main part of the house. It's where people ate, slept, did everything. And the lower part was where they would bring the animals in at night. So it's considered, if you could, the stable, but it's, they wouldn't leave their animals out at night. They'd bring them in. They'd be in the house with them. Well, he did the house. He did yeah. the house. Yeah. So when Mary and Joseph had no room at the inn, it meant that up at that, that platform, that raised platform, every square inch was filled with relatives. So where did they get to stay? In the same house. The but just down with the animals. Well, does that make it even a more lowly thing? Yeah. New straw. Yeah. <laughs> New straw. Yeah. yeah. Fresh straw for the night. Yeah. But the animals are probably fighting them for the straw. And of course, all the visitors, you know, the shepherds and the uh, wise men who came in and, uh, and woke everybody up. Yep. You know, to come in and, mm -hmm. and celebrate Christ's birth. Except that the wise men didn't come that night. Well, you know. Yeah. Some argue that, yes. Yeah. Well, they came Some to the house. Here. They came to the house later when Jesus was a little yeah, older. A house, somewhere. Summertime. Yeah, summertime, of course. 
<sighs> yes, Jim, we're not going to go there. Right. What does Jude... What does, After Christmas. What does Jude flatly condemn? He flatly condemns the activities of these ungodly folk. These ungodly folk are not people you should listen to. Well, how does Jude treat the godly folk? He gently rebukes them, right? <laughs> Beloved, although I was eager to write to you, he's gently rebuking the congregation because he doesn't want... He wants them to identify the false teachers, but he doesn't want them to be treated too harshly. Okay. I think it's interesting that he talks about contending for the faith and not being contentious towards the ungodly. Yeah. Stand for the faith. Speak the truth. Let the truth set you free. Let the tr let's speak scripture and, and, and follow that passage the way it's intended to be meant. That the truth of scripture will set you free and that it will save you and it will, you know, save you for eternity. What does Jude candidly point out? Well, he candidly points out that the gospel itself is at risk for corruption. We're just in verse 1 through 4 and he's already wham. The gospel itself is at risk for corruption by ungodly folk. Who will creep in? Who will start spreading their idea of what truth is? How does God want us to treat the ungodly in the erring? Patiently. In Galatians 6 1, you remember when we were on that. Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him with a spirit of gentleness. They were being treated as members of that congregation. Now, there's a difference between how you teach somebody who's misunderstanding something and somebody who's just out and outright teaching falsely. Most of us fall into the category of we just don't understand yet. We're believing something. We're even going out there and shouting it from the rooftops, but it's because we were falsely taught and we need to be taught rightly. Whereas false teachers are often those who are deliberately trying to pervert the gospel and turn it into this other thing. They need a little bit stronger correction because it's not just the one who's taught wrongly is just often treated differently than the one who teaches wrongly. Although some false teachers are teaching based on stuff they were taught wrongly and they need to be corrected more gently too, probably. So it's a little tricky. Who gets to avoid dealing with false teachers? People who go to really orthodox churches. <laughs> well, you know, it depends on how you want to say avoid dealing. Well, I think your point is going to be no one because we all need to be able to deal with them. Right, right? That's, that's the point. <laughs> so notice, he's got, I would love to tell you about our common faith, have a little koinonia with you. But here's the problem. There's people who've crept into our congregations unnoticed, and they have turned the grace of Christ into a license for sensuality. And he is admonishing them to do what? To contend for the faith. In other words, when there's false teachers who are preaching a false gospel, it's a five-alarm fire. Nobody gets to sit out. Everyone has to jump in and do something about this. Everyone. Everyone. Everyone in this congregation, if there's a false teaching going on in this congregation, should be willing to stand up and say, this is wrong. Who is that? His name's Chris Rosebro. He's a pastor in North, North Dakota somewhere. Lutheran pastor. He does a lot of good, like, just long, con in-context teaching, which is just wonderful. But if you think about it, if you have a congregation or even your group of friends who say, well... We don't see that as wrong, or what's the big deal, or you're just wanting to be contentious all the time, you know. Um, the smaller group of people who want to point out what's going on that's wrong are going to have a hard time. Whereas if everybody in the congregation is well-educated, well-trained in the scriptures, everybody should know what's going on. Everybody should stand up and say, we will not allow that false teaching in our church, in God's church. As a pastor and circuit visitor, many people in congregations say, well, it's mostly right. The gist of the preaching is okay. Uh, it's off a little bit, but 
most of it's right. Mostly right. And, um, and it's a joke among pastors, some pastors in Northern California, was that when he talked about Holy Communion, well, uh, if someone comes to take communion, it's close enough. Their, their ideas, their doctrine that they've accepted is close enough communion, rather than close communion or close communion. And uh, so I think there's, I would say many, but there are many who who believe most of the doctrine. And that's why there's a lot of Lutherans who just take the Lutheran confessions that, well, most of it's right. And there's parts of it that I did, I don't know, I don't agree with, so I'll just take, pick apart, and they do that with scripture. Oh, this, boy, I can't, you know, that, that bothers me, I'm not going to accept that. Or I'm just going to <clears throat> reinterpret it. I'm not going to deny scripture, because I want to be able to stand up before God in the world and say, Scripture alone. I believe that, that if the Scripture says that it's true, all I have to do is change what it means. And if I can change what it means, then I can stand before somebody else who says it means something different and say, well, that's just your interpretation. There was a, a student at Concordia Teachers College in Sioux, Nebraska, when I was there. Ben Gold, who was a farmer Jew, and he came from Chicago. And his mother had the Old Testament, and her he said his her Old Testament had holes in it. She had cut out all the prophecies of the Messiah. She just you know took a little razor blade and cut out all those prophecies of the foretelling of the Christ, the Messiah. And that was her Bible. And some people, I think, do that with scripture, but they don't necessarily cut it out. Mm -hmm. You mean like Thomas Jefferson? How did she know? <laughs> Thomas Jefferson did the same thing. How did she know they, they are prophecies? Well, it said he will come and he will feed the, you know, Isaiah, and you know, he's going to heal the, you know. The, I wonder why she would do that. Why would you eliminate all the prophecies? All well, what can we never do, though, uh, when we're dealing with false teachers? We can never, ever compromise the gospel. But that's what they'll try and get you to do. They'll try and get you to say, it's more than grace alone through faith alone in Christ alone. You have to make a decision. You have to do this. You have to do that. No, salvation is by grace alone through faith alone. Or they'll say, well, you know, like the... If all, you know, you're saved by grace. So, so, you know, come on, let's go to that club. Nobody will see us park there. Nobody will see us walk in. We'll park around back. We'll go in through the back door. You know, nobody will see us there. Come on, you know, God's, God's grace is sufficient. You no, know, they'll quote scripture. And, we'll evangelize them there. Yeah, we'll evangelize them there. Absolutely. Boy, do they need God. we got to go and... For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. That should be all of our attitudes. We should not be ashamed of the gospel. And if we're ever confused as to what it is, go to 1 Corinthians 15. It's right there. It's amazing how many non-believers, uh, whenever there's a time of famine or war or disaster, kind of have a glimpse of hope they, they will become patriotic or they'll become you know they'll go to church like everybody else is going to church maybe they might be searching for something but they just can't seem to find it you know and then everything is all good again and they go back to the non 9-11 factor yep Verse 5 says, Now I want to remind you, although you once fully knew it, that Jesus who saved a people out of the land of Egypt afterwards destroyed those who did not believe. Anybody got a different 
grand the church marquee. Yeah. <laughs> when you read it, Fred, what did yours say? Verse 5. Though you already know all this, I want to remind you that the Lord delivered his people out of Egypt, but later destroyed those who did not believe. Okay. So that's probably NIV. Right. Um, in the NIV, it says that the Lord at one time delivered his people, and in the ESV, it says that Jesus, who saved his people, who saved the people out of Egypt. Different manuscripts. So, Jim answers the next question. Why is there a difference? And this is a wonderful thing about textual criticism. A little bit of a note here. Textual criticism is the study of all of the different manuscripts that we have from the New Testament as well as Old Testament, although Old Testament textual criticism is a little bit behind academically. New Testament textual criticism is a very important field of study, and it turns out we have literally thousands, thousands of fragments, manuscripts, papyri, copies of the New Testament, some of them dating back way old. And this particular change that's in the ESV, and you can see it, now I want to remind you that you once fully knew it, that Jesus who saved a people out of the land of Egypt, there's a reason why the ESV says Jesus and the NIV says Lord. And the reason is simple, because when the NIV 1984 was put together, we didn't have the manuscript that we're basing this on. It wasn't in our possession, and they've since found an, a very old papyri. I mean, really old. Uh, and it includes the Pauline epistles and Jude, and it doesn't say Lord, it says Jesus. I forget the date, but if you, uh, if you email me, I can actually look it up. I, I have it on my computer somewhere, and I read this a while back, but I was very excited about this change, and there's a reason why. Because Lord is soft, Jesus is very specific, and if the earliest manuscripts in the original actually say Jesus, it makes a big difference. Um, this is just mind-bogglingly important for Old Testament studies because Jesus is the one who saved a people out of the land of Egypt, Jude says. Interesting, huh? So the difference being those two things, but the Lord saved the people out of Egypt, right? Well, yeah, because God saved the people out of Egypt. So it's not like it's wrong to say the Lord because Jesus himself is God. But how did Jesus refer to himself? How was he referred to by a lot of other people? As the Lord. Son of God. He saved others. He cannot save himself. He is the King of Israel. Let him come down from the cross and we will believe in him. Yeah, sure. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now if he so desires. For he said, I am the Son of God. That's what they believe. They believe that Jesus was claiming to be the Son of God. Yes, but what does that mean? What does it mean when we say Jesus is the Son of God? Let me show you a passage of Scripture real quick. We say in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, right? Now, how many gods are there? One. one. And the one God consists of how many persons? Three. Three. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Is the Father God? The Holy Spirit is also God. He is a person of the Trinity. And the Son himself is God as well. I'm going to show you a passage of Scripture. It's John chapter 5. And, I'll and I've got to get the specific address real quick here. All right, here it is. All right, let me, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of context. It's John chapter 5. And Jesus heals a guy. And here, I'll start at uh, halfway through verse 9. Now, the day... That day was the Sabbath. So the Jews said to the man who had been healed, It is the Sabbath. It is not lawful for you to take up your bed. Jesus had healed a guy and told him to take up his mat. And so he's taking up his mat and he's leaving. And uh, he answered, Well, the man who healed me, that is the man who said to me, Take up your bed and walk. So they asked him, Who is this man who said to you, Take up your bed and walk? Now the man who had been healed did not know that who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn, as there was a crowd in the place. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you are well. Sin no more, that nothing worse may happen to you. So the man went away and told, Jesus, uh, told the Jews that it was Jesus who had healed him. And this was why the Jews were persecuting Jesus, because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them. Here's what Jesus says. My father is working until now, and I am working. And this is why the Jews were seeking, to kill, uh, seeking all the more to kill him, because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, 
but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. So when we say Jesus is the son of God, understand this, we're talking about son by nature. Okay, and what do we confess in the Nicene Creed? That Jesus is God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father. So the Catholic faith, small c, not Roman Catholic, the Catholic faith has confessed and always confessed that there is one God, three persons. So the Father is God, the Holy Spirit is God, the Son is God. And there are not three gods, there's only one God. Uh-huh. So that's the Trinity. So, and you know, when Jesus said, "Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing and teaching them," right? He baptizing them in the name Hanamas, singular, of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So the one name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Even though there's three, there's only one. But we all understand in this room, I think, that Jesus was referring to himself as God when he called himself the Son of God, and that's what really upset the people, the Jews, the Pharisees, and the Sadducees. Well, how do many people think of or describe of Jesus? They describe him as being not so tough, uh, not, not very manly, right? He's like soft Jesus that, you know, carries lambs around and never raises his voice and never does anything harsh. Well, with this new manuscript evidence, you know, we don't have this exact picture of this nice Jesus. I want to remind you, although you once fully knew it, that Jesus who saved a people out of the land of Egypt afterward destroyed those who did not believe. Again, I always like to say this, and I'll point this out. This gets rid of the whole myth of precious moments, Jesus. You know what I'm saying? Okay. I, I just don't understand the whole precious moments thing. It doesn't make any sense. It's about as appealing as my little pony. Okay. You know, this glitzy, girly-fied type of, you know, Jesus. He was not. Jesus is God in human flesh, and he was the one who judged the children of Israel for their unbelief. He was the one behind this. This is what Jude reveals. But Jesus was a destroyer. The angel of death that went through prior to the exodus that's jesus right that's god it wasn't an angel protect per se if you read the, the, the text it's god said i will go through i will do this how did jesus say to preach about him what did he say how should you preach about jesus well he said in acts and he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to judge the living and the dead. That's a part of the book of Acts I think that a lot of people skip over. Jesus, we're supposed to preach about a Jesus who will come to destroy, right? He will come to judge the living and the dead. We have it in our creed. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. Where did they get that from? Whose kingdom will have no end. It wasn't just something they made up. Right? What will happen at Jesus' second coming, and what should we be doing until then? Well, we should be doing what was told in Second Timothy. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Christian life is not a suffering-free life. If you're out there preaching the word in season and out of season, soberly, it's not a very easy road. But this idea, where the, as we do this, there's a reproving going on and a rebuking going on, but also an exhorting going on. Well, Paul is writing that to a pastor. To a pastor, to a pastoral letter, yes. So the pastors have an obligation. I think it's interesting that I'm going back to the judging the living and the dead, that Martin Luther doesn't mention it at all. 
in the meaning of? The, the, his meaning of the second article. Okay. Well, it's mentioned several times in Scripture. Well, I know, but I'm just I find yeah. it interesting that he, Martin Luther sometimes comes pretty crass, and, <laughs> and uh, but, so I'm surprised he doesn't mention the judgment. Yeah. And there's a, just a, a certain Jesus, if you watch a lot of preaching and listen to a lot of stuff that you shouldn't probably listen to, there's a lot of talk about a different kind of Jesus, a Jesus that would not be looked upon as a, a destroyer or a judge. He's got to be this softer guy. Jim? Well, number one, uh, Isaiah says that when God judges, that is his alien work. So I think we need to give emphasis to both parts of that phrase. I mean, yes, it's the work of God to judge, but it's his alien work. Why is it his alien it. work? What? Why is it his alien work? He doesn't want to do it. He doesn't, doesn't want to, doesn't do want it. to have to do it. proper work. Right. The Son of Man came not to judge. Well, he didn't come to condemn because the world stands condemned already. He didn't have no, to go well, through that process. What he came was to seek and to save the lost. And I'm telling you, if you tell unbelievers that Jesus is going to get them if they don't believe, they're going to say, to heck with Jesus. Nobody's saying to say that. Well, <laughs> put that verse on a church marquee. Okay. Spring Church Christ, several years ago, on their marquee, on the marquee it said, whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. And that's the verse from Hebrews. And I'm like, they really do not agree with church growth, do they? <laughs> really, 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 really. I have been jokingly saying for quite almost 10 years now, our, our, the, we should put it on our church sign, come suffer for the gospel with us. Because that's what the Christian life really is. Instead, we have to be happy, clappy, soft, squishy Jesus, come on in, and then, oh, wait, if we do this in a Bible study, if we even talk about this in a Bible study, let alone from the pulpit, you're not going to come back next week. But there's a difference between preaching to those who are not saved and instructing those who have already come to faith. For instance, what Pastor just said about the second article. Catechism is meant to be used by the father of the family in the family circle. In other words, you're teaching your children. It was originally written for pastors. This is what Jesus came to do. He came to be the Savior. The, you know, He is your Savior. He loves you. You need to trust in Him. Okay. Now, Likewise, you have, uh, you know, I, it's just, well, for instance, you mentioned earlier, okay, we can interpret the angel of death in the 10th plague of Egypt as being Christ. So I would have a really hard time answering an unbeliever who said, okay, so you're saying because Pharaoh, king of Egypt, did not listen to the word of Moses, God, Jesus came down and killed the child of every Egyptian family in a country where Pharaoh is an absolute monarch and the people have absolutely no influence on what he says, does, or thinks. So therefore God, the just judge of the whole earth, slaughtered the children of the Egyptians to punish the king of Egypt. How am I supposed to answer that? You don't answer it quickly. Well, I believe... If you that can't get it. somebody into a Bible study and actually teach them about the context of what was going on in Egypt, you can't properly instruct them on a, a question that somebody gave them to throw out to try and make you answer a question a certain way. In teaching the catechism at, for 50 years, uh, talked about judgment. Uh, what does the judge do? We usually teach judging what's going to be guilty. However, the judge also says not guilty. And Jesus will judge your innocent, those who believe. And those who don't will not be judged, in that sense. Be judged, you know, condemned. So in teaching children, and especially junior high school, I go, ooh, judging. They, they sense already that age that you go to court, they're going to get nailed. Yeah. However, the judge can pronounce innocent or not guilty. I guess. Is it innocent or not guilty? I forget. You know, you know, we know what you mean. But, you know, in that sense, it's a wonderful thing. 
God's judgment on us is a wonderful thing that he judges this innocent for the sake of his son, Jesus Christ. Judge me, O God. Vindicate my cause against yeah. an ungodly nation. Right. Steve. Just to uh, extend that, uh, not guilty does not necessarily mean innocent. Because there is a distinction in there. Not that, especially mm-hmm. when a lawyer knows that his yeah. client is guilty. That's it. gets him off. But, you know, uh, I... I was looking for some evidence behind the Jesus being present uh, in the Old Testament. And everybody, well, there's a lot of people who believe uh, that, you know, the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and he was there, you know, from the beginning. I mean, when they were walking in the cool of the garden, they were walking with Jesus. Yeah, and there's so many different references about Jehovah. And the translation that Pastor on the the audio I was talking about was the translations between the Greek and the Latin. Mm-hmm. That's where some of the old manuscripts, and that's why the Jew picked up on uh, right. Jesus being present. It's also important to remember that while non-believers can benefit from the preaching of the word in a church service, the preaching of the word in a church service is for the believers that are there gathered. Primarily. It's meant to rebuke and exhort and prove, prove and it's, it's meant to do the law and the gospel. It's meant to do God's work amongst believers, primarily. If an unbeliever is there and they hear that they're a sinner in need of a savior, and they hear that there's this Jesus that saves them from their sins, and the Holy Spirit works faith in them, wonderful. But if you start crafting your services to appeal to get to, to basically be seeker services, seek, uh, unbeliever services, you're going to start not feeding the sheep. And you're going to do a major disservice to what God called you to do. Yes or no? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Closing prayer, <laughs> <Closing> please. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for gathering us together to be about the study of your word, and we thank you for leading and guiding our study through your spirit, Lord. And we ask all of this, Lord, in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Good class, guys. Good discussion.